Well, hello, Lee Sales. Hello, Annabelle Crabb. You're wearing the same outfit you were two weeks ago. And strangely enough, so are you. This is the uh, our recent decision to start filming these podcasts as definitely going to ping us for the time <laughs> when we are so pushed for time that we record two together. <laughs> This exactly. is one of those uh, Or maybe instances. we just do wear the same outfit every time. It's on the spreadsheet just to wear the same outfit for podcasting every time. So exactly. That it's just... That's Chris has got that all worked out. Hey, could I quickly tell you about something that I think a few people have been talking about, which is a show called The Menu, uh, which is okay. a film. I think Is this a Disney horror Plus. movie? It is a horror okay, movie, that's yeah. That's why I haven't seen it. Okay. It's, I didn't realise it was a horror movie when I started it, but it is, it's, I, I hate horror. Uh, the thing that gets me over the line sometimes with horror, and I'm thinking of Misery by Stephen King and the yeah. film version of that. You're is, obsessed with that movie, honestly. I you, love you bring it up misery. everywhere. You can I find a way it. to get misery into any conversation. I like um comedy with my horror. It must be that it leavens the horror slightly. And also if it's real I I mean it's awful because it's it's like succession. It makes me wonder about myself because the menu, it's so black so violent but oh, it's sounds great it's uh i found it really funny okay so it's I okay so the premise is right? the premise is it's one of those uber uber elite restaurants it's like you know one of the world's top restaurants right, okay. the kind of thing that would be on chef's table okay and a group of people you get on a boat and you get taken to the restaurant which is on an island mm-hmm. and so they have parodied absolutely beautifully the kind of people that goes to these restaurants so it's the hardcore foodies who've watched you know every episode and they're tasting oh i taste cinnamon and blah 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 it's the the you know tech bros who are all out for their like work kind of thing and they're all you know right. just okay. loaded yeah the older completely wealthy couple who are there for their eighth time but they just sit at the table and don't say anything to each other for the entire and time and then they later leave a disappointing trip advisor review <laughs> i was expecting really something really special for our 50th wedding anniversary i was a bit disappointed when <laughs> the um new york times food reviewer and her friend that she's brought along uh, and then the dude who's on a, a date kind of thing. Anyway, Ray Fines is the head oh, chef okay. of this restaurant. And you start, I didn't know anything about it other than someone had told me to watch it. So I didn't actually know it was a horror film when I started. Oh, God, that's unfair. You can't recommend a horror film and not tell and someone not, that it's a horror film. But I started to wonder straight away. It was giving me a feeling of unease straight away. Ray Fines it starts um, serving up course after course and it becomes clear that there is a theme that has been devised for the evening and that each course... Is it course, like cannibalism? Is it, I'm is not going to oh, say... It's cannibalism. I mean, it's not. It's actually not cannibalism, but there's, there is a theme and I don't want to say more to kind of spoil it. Mm. It was... I was laughing my ass off, but also just like... Are you supposed to like, laugh though? Yeah, I think oh, you are. Okay, I think right. it's black comedy, oh, okay. um, but it is kind of... The, the first moment when it shifts where you know for certain that it's a horror film is kind of like, oh, my God. And then after that, it kind of, say, I got a big shock and then I was like, oh, this is where this is going. And then I was able to kind of, I was going to say relax into it, but it's you don't relax into it. Anyway, it's if you are somebody, I can see that Annabelle Crabb is never going to watch this. But well, I don't know. I mean, if you if you talk up the funny enough, I might watch it. But, like, I've got rules for watching horror movies. One of them is that I have to sit with my back to the wall, to a wall oh, while yeah. I'm watching it just okay. so that nobody, I get it. and I mean nobody, can come up and do that thing that they think is funny where they go, yeah. because that is not funny to me. I will keep my back to the wall thing going on even to go to the toilet. <laughs> I will like back to the wall and I'll shuffle along back to the wall, back to the wall, back to the wall, toilet. Whoosh, but do you get nervous wall, going to the, the toilet when yes. watching a horror film? Same. Yep. I think there's going to be an alligator or something yep. in there that's going to Always suck an alligator. you down. It's, well, I reckon that stems from when I was a kid. There was a film, I think it was called Alligator. And it was the premise of the film was someone flushed a baby alligator down the toilet, oh. and then it morphed and mutated in the yeah. sewer things. And yeah, so you've been in worried about getting your ass munched by an since. alligator ever since. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see, see yesterday that vision of that shark in WA off the coast of WA? No. Oh my god! I'll send it to you in a minute. It, okay. it was this. Just came to my mind because we were in WA not that long ago yeah. swimming. It was this epically massive tiger, tiger shark, and it was. So close to the shore, I can't okay. even tell you. It was that is relaxing. It was really relaxing. The first horror movie I ever saw unintentionally is I went to a slumber party at my friend's house and they had rented a VHS a video recorder. I'd never seen a video recorder before. That's how elderly I am. <laughs> and they showed American Werewolf in London. Oh. And I thought, oh, this is an interesting movie. The guy goes to a uh, pub. Okay, it's a bit boring. He's walking home across the moors. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
And I'd never, I didn't even know that horror movies existed. Right. I was so terrified that I went and hid underneath the birthday girl's bed for right. the whole thing. And then I, you know, like I grew up on a farm. It was my job to kind of shut the chooks up at dusk. Oh. And I just oh, was so terrified. I thought they'd, yeah. Do you know, I had a not dissimilar experience in that a mate sprung a film on me like that and in my case it was Nightmare on Elm Street. And, yeah, I, yeah. I do think it kind That's, of. Yeah, messed you up? Yeah. Yeah, no, I can't do I can't do horror movies. Um, um, bookmark, actually, I've got a funny anecdote to tell you in a minute about horror movies oh, well, where I grew up. Oh, you can do it now? Yeah. Okay, so um, where I grew up place that's a spooky place to shut up chooks. Um, I think possibly my fears might have been magnified by the fact that about two k's up the road was a safari park. It's closed now, but it was oh. called like the Two Worlds or the Adelaide Plains Safari Park. Oh. They had lions there oh. and, you know. You they could, could escape maybe. Well, I mean, it was just like paddocks, but they had exotic animals in there. I mean, I just don't know how this was allowed to happen. And you could visit and you just paid them 10 bucks and you could drive into the paddock with the lions in it. Like oh. you just kept your windows oh. wound up. Yeah. And I remember there was once sort of some suspicion that a lioness had escaped or whatever. But either way, we could hear the roaring like on a clear night. Mm. So maybe that didn't contribute to my peace of mind. But the landscape around there is very flat, kind of like it's it, it goes down to the beach where there's sort of like um, – salt bush, scrub, um, sand dunes, and it looks incredibly post-apocalyptic. I mean, it's lovely and there's beautiful birds and I love it, but it does look a bit like, you know, right. society has ended. And for a while it was popular to drive cars and burn them out down there. So it like for a while before it cleared up, it was kind of like a real Mad Max type of look. So my parents occasionally let people make films there because it looks right. it's quite close to Adelaide. Right. So it's convenient. Right. But it also looks like it could be in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right. So there's been various films and series and stuff made there. And in fact, the TV series Wolf Creek was shot at my parents' <laughs> place. And of course, I have never watched a second of that series because I can't bear. Oh, yeah, horror, right. Right. And I can't show it to my children either. Like, look yeah, at Harry right. Grandpa's house with people being murdered and strung up, you know. Did, but, you, did your dad or anyone have a cameo in it? No, but dad, who's a highly annoying proprietor, would like drive around when they were shooting in the middle of the night, like in his PJs in the ute. He was once escorted off the set because he was. they were shooting a scene where a girl gets into the car and <laughs> my dad, according to him, <laughs> pulled up and went, don't get in the car, darling. <laughs> Can you imagine you're a director working to, you know, shooting after hours and this absolute lunatic. Anyway, the other film that they made there was this um, zombie movie. And I'm yeah. like, oh, great, zombie yeah. movie. I'm not gonna, Another one I won't be able to watch, you know. Anyway, I only found out recently that because my daughter looked it up and watched it and she said, oh, it's actually quite a good movie. Anyway, this was shot a few years back and I remember my brother driving past um, on one of the tracks and noticing that there was a port porter loo that had been set up and had this sort of line of zombies waiting up to <laughs> use it and he didn't know about the shooting of the film so he was just like, what the hell? There's, oh, God, I don't know what that is, probably some daft project. Anyway, it turns out that the film was called Cargo and stars Martin Freeman. Wow. And Freeman, Freeman was at your property. Right. Wow. And it was, I mean, it won some awards and things and also oh. Susie Porter was in it. Oh. I can't believe Martin Freeman, one of my favourite actors on the <laughs> face of the earth, was at my place. <laughs> and because I just went, oh, zombie movie, I, I made no inquiries. It's terrible. Anyway. You mentioning the zombies queuing at the toilet yeah. reminded me of Better Things because they often show film yeah, sets, yeah, yeah. which reminds me again of the Better Things podcast that I spoke about in the last episode. Have you ever heard of a thing, this was a revelation to me when they discussed it, have you ever heard of actors having to do a job called Scratch Voice? No. Okay, so I had no idea this was the thing. They were talking about how at a certain um, point – Hollywood shifted from using professional actors to do animated films to using celebrities and you'd bring in a celebrity right. voice. And they were yeah. they were complaining about it because they were saying a five-year-old really doesn't give a toss if it's Angelina Jolie yeah. or whoever voicing yeah. it. And they said that the film that they thought was the last of the films to use a great voice actor was The Little Mermaid and they rattled oh, off a whole okay. lot of names of people yeah. who hadn't done it. And so this was Cree Summer and Pamela Adlon. They had both been hired repeatedly to do work called Scratch Voice, which is you hire an amazing actor who's got an awesome character voice to come in and they do all the heavy lifting of working out 
how the character's going to deliver lines and all of the options. And then they bring in a celebrity and the celebrity just mimics <gasps> what that person's done. And that's the scratch. They're the scratch voice. Oh, Isn't that, that shocking? Wrong. I mean, I, I kind of, I felt like it seemed absolutely shocking. And then I thought, well, I suppose if they're getting paid and that's what they're paid oh. for, but doesn't it seem horrendous that then a celeb comes in and they go, okay, I haven't listened to this and just ape exactly. Cause you think the, the work that would go into the nuance of reading a script and thinking, oh, I'm going to actually imbue that line with like, that they, it's kind of like, I don't care about yeah. something, you know, like that's hard work thinking all of that through. Wow. But I mean, isn't that sort of your job when you're an actor? I mean, like, why wouldn't somebody who's a highly paid film actor be able to do that themselves? Because maybe they want just one day's work or that's all yeah, they're right. available for or whatever. It reminds me of years ago I interviewed Samuel Johnson who was the voice oh. of um, The Burgers Better at Hungry Jack's and we were talking about was how he? he... Yeah. Huh. And we were talking about the tone of that and I was saying I thought it was so clever how he read it and he said the thought process. So he said it like... He wasn't trying to persuade you that the burgers are better at Hungry Jacks. He de he delivered it like it's so obvious, like oh, the burgers right. are better at Hungry Jacks. Um, and he said he just thought that was the best way to deliver it because it's like it's just so obvious. Everybody knows it. Yeah, right. Burgers are better at Hungry Jacks. So you're Jacks. creating this sense of majority view. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And so I thought, wow, that's so much more clever than doing a really like the burgers are better at Hungry Jacks. That would be the sales technique. Like. <laughs> I know, you I know. don't. Shut up. <laughs> I'll tell you. The burgers are better at Hungry Jack. Um, yeah, anyway, it's it's um, it's um kind of fascinating. But I, I was interested that you haven't heard of Scratch Voice either because I've no. never heard of it. Bit of a secret maybe. Wow. Okay, so, that's yeah. sort of upsetting. Anyway, what else have you been? Uh, well, I was sort of, I mean, I was on a bit of a Martin Freeman deep dive because I've been watching Breeders, um, yeah. a show that I've talked about in previous pods, which is incredibly black comedy. <laughs> Um, involving Martin Freeman um, and his wife bringing up to um, uh, I'm just trying to remember the actress's name and I will in a minute as soon as I stop trying to remember. Um, she's amazing, incredible actor um, and it's just like incredibly dark jokes about parenting young children. Right. Like, um, it's right up my alley. I love it. Um, and Freeman is, that too, is in that too and I just um, started watching Masters of Sex which is um, a show that you've gone on and on and on and on yes. to me about and I've refused to follow you and watch <laughs> it. Um, and, of course, because I was just sort of so reminded of what why Martin Freeman is such an incredible character actor. I mean, he's got the greatest face on television. You can just – I think I could watch a movie where it would be clear to me what Martin Freeman thought just by looking at his face. Like he hardly ever has to speak. Um, if you're wondering who Martin Freeman is, he was on The Office, the British version of The Office. He was in Lord of the Rings. Yes. Yeah. Um, heaps of things. Yeah, he's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I jumped into Masters of Sex and... And first, what do you think? Uh, all right. I've only watched one episode so far. Absolutely loved it. I thought it was brilliant. And the other thing is um, his offsider... I suddenly clicked as to where I know her from because, I mean, um, what's her name? Case Ka um, Ka It's Libby, Lizzie Kaplan. Lizzie Kaplan, thank you. So I've recently watched and loved her in Fleischman's in Trouble. Yes, she was I thought brilliant she was spectacular. And the whole time I'm thinking, where the hell do I know you from? I know she's such a familiar actress and I can remember that I really liked her and whatever else I've seen her in and I couldn't remember what. And then I realised Mean Girls. She's um, she's the kind of goth character in Mean Girls. Oh, I've never seen Mean Girls. Oh, so. <laughs> oh, you have to see Mean Girls. And you it's also so told me the other day that Lizzie Kaplan is Matthew Perry's ex-girlfriend, that when you were right. reading his book that yeah. that's the woman that he was talking Broke about. Broke his heart, yeah. Yeah, wow. Um, God, amazing. I can't wait till you get a bit further into Masters of Sex to hear what you think of it because I think she and Martin Sheehan, who plays William Masters, they're yeah. both just absolutely brilliant and some of the supporting performances are really superb too and particularly in season one because you've got Alison Janney and Bo Bridges who oh yeah um and they're both so fantastic as is the woman who plays um um Libby Masters his wife yep, yep. she's fantastic and evolves really well so yeah I cannot wait until you get a bit oh more yeah no that. I've got a way to go with that and I love it now um the other thing I've been watching is you know how I went on and on to you about um, that series called Ghosts, which is um, it's a British series shot in a beautiful old kind of um, 
like castle mansion. Right. And the storyline is there's this um, young woman and her husband kind of struggling. They're looking for a London flat. They suddenly get a call from a lawyer. Turns out that this little known great aunt of the woman has um, left her this regional pile in right. rural England. And it's this huge, crumbling, beautiful country house. And she's the only surviving descendant. She goes there with her husband. It's falling down. It's full of rats and pigeons. They think, well, let's do it up, mortgage ourselves to the hilt and make it into a hotel or an Airbnb. She falls out of a window accidentally and um, when she um, recovers consciousness, she can see the approximately one dozen ghosts who live in the house. <laughs> And they are the ghosts of people that have lived in the house or um, died, you know, before the house was there in the area. You know? Right. So there's a Neanderthal guy. There's, oh. you know, a scout master who got shot through the neck with an arrow um, while running a scout camp at the house, you know. And there's her great ancestor who's this sort of dowager lady. Anyway, um, her husband obviously can't see the ghosts. So, you know, right. madcap comedy ensues and so on. Um, it's a great series. I thought it was brilliant. Um, very, very funny. The kids love it. It's kind of reason. It's family friendly. There's the odd sort of shagging gag, but it's survivable. So there's been a US version made. Oh, and we are now watching that. Oh, and I thought I'll just we'll just watch one episode to see if it's rubbish. It's fantastic. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, and it good. Does, I it, thought you were like going to say it was stays, rubbish. Like there's different storylines. So mm -hmm. anyway, I you know it's a complete every night necessity oh, in our great. house. Like, okay. like it's very funny. Um, and they've got like different characters as well. Um, uh, there's a Native American character who is absolutely superb. Um, anyway, I was watching this and um, loving it and then I noticed in the credits that it was directed by Trent O'Donnell who's an Australian director now based in the US, had a company here called Jungle Boys, um, has been in the US for quite a few years. But he was um, uh, the first director of Kitchen Cabinet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, like wow. the loveliest dude and incredibly good at his job and smart and, you know, just a real pro. And he's gone ahead and made this sort of great career in the US. So I'm like, Jesus, Trent. And then so I went, I'll just go and check on what else um, Trent's directed. All right. So he directed uh, an episode of Hacks. Oh, yeah. He directed 28 episodes of New Girl, which oh, is yeah. a show that I completely love and watch with my teenage daughter all the time. Three episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah. One of my favourite shows. Um, he directed Laid and The Letdown. Love The Letdown. And he also directed Colin from Accounts. I've just started watching Colin I from Accounts. You, yeah, you mentioned yeah. it since. So I'm like, I'm how enjoying cool it. is that? What a guy. It's great. Well, congratulations, Trent. Well You're done. A legend. Well done, Trent. Um, yeah, Colin from Accounts, one of my friends in Brizzy was loving it and I'd heard really good things about it so I started watching it. It is about uh, a couple, well, they're actually not a couple. They, so they're two people who meet when um, she's crossing the road and he hits a dog. Um, they kind of oh. flirt as she crosses the road and then he gets distracted and hits a dog. And so then they kind of like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? This the dog, dog survives. And so I, I'm not going to say. And oh, then it kind of goes God. from there. And then it's, Maybe means no. <laughs> it's sort of a, I guess you'd call it a romantic comedy, but it's kind of a, it's not that predictable. Um, oh, it's okay. not like they just, it's not a meet cute where they get together straight away kind right. of thing. Okay. Um, there's some great supporting performances. The two lead actors are a couple in real life. And so they have great. The chemistry is really nice. The rhythm is yeah. really good. Um, so, yeah, it's a kind of, when I say small, I don't mean that in, as an insulting way because, as you know, I love a small book and a small yeah. show. What I mean by that is it's focused on, like, kind of the minutiae of life. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I would say it's a small, sweet show. And so, and you know, I rate that kind of thing. But it, it is built around the interaction and the relationship between these guy and a girl. So it's like one of those sort of highly observational things where you see something and you go, oh, my God, that's so true. It's, it's. It is, it's not highly observational. It's more plot driven and character driven. Um, it's not like Better Things or Louis, which are like almost entirely observational. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's less observational than that, um, but still got enough of that that holds my attention. Excellent. So I'd recommend it to yeah, you. Yeah, great. And also, when you were talking about ghosts, I was wondering if you, that you were going to be talking about. Um, 
a television version of a novel that I just read also called Ghosts. Oh, this is Dolly Alderton's yeah, book. Dolly yeah, Dolly Alderton's book. Have you read any of her books? Uh, yes. I read a different one of hers, which is about um, it was what I know a, about a memoir. Love. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. That was the first of hers I read. And I, I at the time, I loved that so much that I downloaded Ghosts and I only just got around to reading yeah. it. So Ghosts is a novel. It's about a woman who is kind of, it, it's about a few different things actually. It's about a woman in her 30s who's trying to come to grips with is she going to be in a relationship or not. She meets this guy um, via a dating app. They go and meet at the pub. They embark on this relationship. And then, um, I, again, I don't want to spoil it too much, but it kind of goes from there. So it's about, um, it's partly about the way that, I think this is a more common experience for women than men where women can be in what they think is a relationship that's working pretty well and then the dude just kind of disappears. Uh -huh. It's oh, so partly, it's about ghosting a little bit. It's about ghosting, oh, yeah. Okay. So it's called when it's called ghosts because it's about ghosting. It, she's also dealing with her father who has dementia and is increasingly becoming, you know, a less ghost. and less. Yep. But then it's also a little bit about friendship and how with long-term friendships how you can hit a point where you just don't have that much in common anymore even though you used to be really good friends and how, how you navigate that and the kind of acts of generosity that it requires on both ends to keep trying to find common ground and, it, and at what point does that become kind of you know, you can't just keep a friendship going on the fact that you used to be old friends, that you used to be close. And so, you know, how does that kind of keep going? And I think perhaps points out that sometimes people with kids um, are frankly a bit smug and also a bit not understanding of people who don't have kids mm -hmm. um, and how they kind of feel like, well, I've got kids. And so that means I've got big responsibilities yeah. and you're a single woman in your 30s and you don't have kids. And so therefore, my time's, you know, more right. precious and harder one than yours kind of thing. And yeah, I know from... very annoying. Yep. Yeah, and I know from friends who are in that position how massively annoying they can find those kind of presumptions. So it explores lots of different things and it's just, I mean, I just really enjoy I think she's a great writer and funnily enough I read off the back of it because um, I listened to Dolly Alderton's po podcast. She did one with Marion Keyes, the Irish writer. Oh, right. When I was in my 20s, I used to love Marion Keyes and right. read her and they have this really great conversation and Dolly clearly is a fan of Marion Keyes. And so then that made me think, oh, I haven't read Marion Keyes for years. I better go and might go and read her latest book. So I read this book that she was talking about on the Dolly Ald Alderton podcast called The Break. Um, and I guess a bit like Dolly's where Dolly's is exploring a woman, you know, in her thirties relationship, Marion Keyes is, is a woman who's in her forties, whose husband has said after like nearly 20 years together, I just want to have a break from oh, our marriage. Okay. Right. And she, in the podcast, when she was giving the backstory of this book, she was saying, this is a not uncommon thing for women and, and couples of a certain age where they just kind of get bored with each other and they want to break, but they don't necessarily want to sort of say Blow goodbye. Up, yeah. yeah. Um, and so she explores that. I didn't enjoy it as much as Dolly's book and I, I kind of, by the end I was kind of skim reading to get through it. Right, okay. Yeah. But That's never good. No, <laughs> but it was it was okay. Um, that actually gives me an opportunity to talk about a book that I read actually a few months ago because I was sent the manuscript to read it and, you know, sometimes you get asked to maybe do a cover quote if you like it. Yeah. Um, and it's a book it's a non-fiction book. It's like a sort of a, a bit of a memoir. It's kind of like a collection of essays by Kate Legg, who, oh, um, yes. who I don't know personally except by reputation. Like she lives in Melbourne. I live in Sydney. We have friends in common. Um, I kind of, and I've always been just a massive admirer of hers because um, her capacity to write, particularly feature articles about people, uh, is just really um, good. Yeah. She's like really leader of the pack um in that area in Australian writing and um uh anyway she emailed me and she said oh look you know would you mind reading this book she said I'm, I'm, I'm kind of blowing up my life a bit in this book that I'm writing I'm like oh I'm always interested <laughs> <laughs> right anyway, up my alley says Annabelle Crabb so it's called um infidelity and other affairs and it's out like I think when this podcast comes out it'll be out the next day so it'll right. be out tomorrow um and what it is, it's quite remarkable, like the opening few chapters are about her experience of her husband of many years having an affair and her discovery of this, her reaction to it, their attempts to kind of repair their relationship. So far so, you know, like it's traumatic but not exactly original for, you know, a, a kind of a memoir um, subject. 
What she then does is she starts thinking about whether um, patterns of um, uh, of infidelity are hereditary. Are they a family pattern? So then she goes and with her ex-husband kind of explores the history of his family because there's like a pretty profound episode of infidelity in his family and then they look at the younger generation as well. It's like this extraordinary can't explain it. It's incredibly gripping to read because it's so frank. And it sounds she's, amazing. And she's very frank about her own responses, even when, you know, like I'm I'm sure bits of it would have been hard to write, like, you know, her attempt to kind of, you know, dress more sexy to kind of, you know, like and all this sort of stuff. It's just, it's almost like unbearably intimate to read. But there's something about her attitude that's so it's very wise and very sort of there's a sort of grace about it that mm. is um it's quite moving she also there's another couple of chap there's another couple of chapters um that are about her family and particularly her um brother who's had like mental health struggles all his life and you know, the family's always tried to look after him. He's a difficult character, sometimes loves them, sometimes massively resents them. Resents them. You never know what kind of mood he's going to be in. And somehow that feeds into this idea of, you know, family curses, you know, and mm. family secrets. And um, anyway, I just I found it um, a really moving collection of essays. There's other essays on things like, you know, how she got into, um, you know, the restorative power of walking and going on long walks. And so there's other kind of right. subjects of, of essays, but easily the most captivating are those very um, personal ones. Is it? Does she explore her own, within that longer term relationship, her own desire to cheat or opportunities or? It's really about um, reconciling herself with, you know, what's happened and, you um, and, you know, the, the the other party involved was a friend as well. So that's oh. kind of, you know, I, I, what what is also fascinating about it is that the ex-husband and, you know, anyone who works in the media knows the ex-husband. So, like, yeah. you know, that's another kind of um, layer that makes me amazed that the book's out there because the ex-husband is obviously has read the book and um, she talks about his response to it. Right. Which is an extraordinary thing because... Between them, you get this sense of sort of a preparedness to listen. Yeah, that, that right. I imagine would be quite rare in those episodes. I think it reflects well on both of them, to be oh, honest. Oh, totally. It's, I mean, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? Because it's that question of you know art and you know mining mm. your life and other people's lives by association for art, yeah. and you know how that kind of um, unfolds. But I mean, you know, you could imagine that some dudes would have hit the roof and said, you're not writing about oh, that. And, a thousand you know, percent. And so, particularly someone in that position. So, I mean, it made me just think, wow, that's like, that's an amazing, I don't know, there's acts of grace, I think, um, and forgiveness on both sides, which I think is a very, um, it's it's quite profound. And I think, well, if the purpose of art is to make sense of life, yeah. which it is, right, then why should it stop at your own, you know, I mean, it, most of us read books and watch films and look at paintings and listen to podcasts to give us an idea of how to deal with situations in our own lives or to inspire us. And so when you apply that, when you are an artist and you apply it to your own life, it's yeah. obviously like it creates all these issues, but like, why shouldn't you analyze your own life Definitely. By reading and thinking and writing and doing all those things that um, are therapeutic. I, yeah. I mean, I often think I've interviewed people and asked about stuff that I just would not answer or participate in the other way around. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. I also love the title, Infidelity and Other Affairs. Yeah. That is a great title. It is. Anyway, look, I just think, yeah, it's 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 a terrific book. I, you know, I... Um, Started reading it straight away as soon as it was sent. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is just – I couldn't put it down. Um, now I'm going to – I've got – I know you're about to call time, but I've got one more book that I just want to mention. Yes. Um, because it's so good. Um, a year or two ago I talked about a book called The Adversary by a um, young Melbourne writer called Ronnie Scott. I thought it was a really accomplished first novel. And um, Ronnie Scott's published another novel now called Shirley and it is – 
superb. Oh. It is absolutely tremendous. So Shirley of the title is is a house that used to be owned by this famous um, sort of cooking identity who had this absolute scandal and was um, photographed by the paparazzi fleeing this house, covered in blood, wearing a distinctive jacket, then moved overseas and made a career overseas, but is still sort of notorious in Australia. And the story is about her daughter, who is sort of looks a lot like her mum, is recognised everywhere, but is like not fame seeking at all. She's in a relationship um, which breaks down over the course of the book. And it's about her um, reconciling herself with the memory of her mother, the reality of her mother, the lifestyle of her mother, the house, what happened in the house, the boyfriend. There's this sort of exotic woman that's moved in next door who has quite a complicated life. Anyway, it's it's less the plot that marks the brilliance of this book. It is um, just razor sharp and original writing mm. that is funny and profound and I just think Ronnie Scott is a major talent and oh, okay. I really, yeah, it's a great, great book. You, I, I must say I read something the other day or I saw that reference and I didn't think I would immediately go grab it but having heard you say that, I'm like, wow, oh, that's gone is, straight to yeah, the top of the list. Yeah, it's great, really cool. good. The other thing that's happening right after this podcast is Back in Time for Dinner. Well, the latest iteration, Back in Time for the Corner Shop, is on TV. And um, it is an extremely good series that we shot during the federal election campaign last year. So I wasn't stressed at all. I was pinging back and forth between 2022 and 1850. Oh. But the poor old Verones, <laughs> we make them run a corner shop for 150 years. So they go through like everything from, you know, colonial times to yo-yo phases to, you know. The whole thing. Yeah. I, I feel terrible because I was just so rude then looking at my phone because yeah. I didn't realise you were talking to me. I thought you were just talking to the was, audience. No, I was talking to you, love. Never mind. <laughs> I didn't realise it. I do I, think you and your children will enjoy this series though, but fine, have it your way, watch something else. I didn't realise. I was the target market for your promo. See, I thought, this is I thought the you were talking about through now me. that we're on video and then I there turned is proof to, of this woman's rude. And so after I checked my emails, I was like, oh, anything, shit, she's talking to me. <laughs> anything interesting? God, you're a monster. Watch the show. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>